Good evening and thank you for joining us on this very special program coming to you live from Ben Television as we put on our social media handles, our Facebook, Twitter and of course um, every other social uh, media outfit that we run also in connection and partnership with our other media partners. We're bringing to you information uh, involving um, Goyal Bradrush. Of course, let me just quickly establish this information. Goyal Bradrush was James Ibori's solicitor. I mean, very many of us, we do know who James uh, Ibori is, a former Delta State uh, governor who was convicted, um, who pleaded uh, uh, in a case of money laundry and was convicted in February 2013. Goy Brothers was also convicted in November 2010. But years after that, having spent his time, Goyal decided to appeal his case. In the course of appealing his case, um, the CPS, that's the Grand Position Service, decided to charge him again for attempting to power the cause of justice. He lost indeed that case at the appeal. So he went, he was charged, and um, he had to face the CPS and the law again. But in the course of that, Unknown issues and revelations began to surface that included uh, police corruption, how deep it runs, the cover up, and of course the prosecutor's misconduct and the dishonesty in the case involving Goyle and of course uh, James Ebory. It's no longer news, it's been out there in the mainstream media how these so-called uh, investigations seems to have been uh, corrupted to say and the, the, the eventual outcome of this was that uh, the prosecutors involved in this case now following media backlash and the success of Goyal in proving uh, before the courts that the officers had of course um, uh, the prosecutors have been involved in uh, dishonest misconduct in uh, run up to his uh, confiscation. Um, so, conviction, I say. So, today we want to review issues around Goyle and, of course, the deep seated corruption that have been uncovered, including the misconduct and dishonesty of either or of both the police and of course the prosecutors involved in his case and of course James Hibori's case. Joining me on the program today, he's a man who has been involved in that process, who has successfully fought on behalf of Goyal and succeeded in establishing the fact that the police officer involved and of course the prosecutors have a uh, displayed a high level of dishonesty and uh, well according to uh, this was put which has led to there being the mood from the case. Joining me in, this, in the studio today is Stephen Gap, Stephen Cambridge QC uh, to talk about some of the issues I have raised and how far this case is going to go. Stephen thank you for being part of the program. All right. We do appreciate your time with us. Can I just quickly ask you, give us a bit of some background to what happened and how you were able to prove that there has been some element of dishonesty, misconduct and corruption. Right. Well, after Badresh Gohill's conviction, he received information that some police officers who'd been investigating the original James Ibori case um, had been taking bribes. Mm. Police, officer Police investigating officers investigating James Abori. Who was on that investigation for corruption? Who were on the investigation for the money laundering case money laundering. against James Abori. Now the police involved yeah. are now involved in corruption themselves. And that he received information that they were taking bribes, mm. right? For giving information to the Abori camp and also he received information that they were giving information back to the police from the Abori camp. Wow. So they were acting as double agents. These wow. And one police officer in particular was the center of his focus of this corruption, whose name is Detective Constable McDonald. So, so let's so establish this very well before 
we proceed so that my viewers we actually yeah. grasp what we're talking about here yeah that he is or there was a police officer involved in the investigation into the money laundering money yes. involved yeah. with james Ibori. yeah and this officer has from the discovery has been a double agent collecting money from yes. james Ibori's camp so let me just explain how he explain. became involved yes go ahead. so james Ibori's solicitors yes. employed a firm called risk management mm. private investigators who are mostly ex-police officers to advise them about the case so it was a complex case involving fraud allegedly and so they employed this firm to advise them but unbeknown to Badresh Gohill, um, this firm had a relationship with the, one of the main police officers who were investigating James Abori. Mm. So he was receiving money to give information to the Abori camp, allegedly. Um, receiving about money the, from who? From, from risk management? From, well, risk management were providing the officer with money and he was giving them information about the police investigation, which is basic corruption. And then, at the same time, unbeknown to them who were employing risk, the police officer was giving information from they got from risk back to the police at the same time. So he was giving and getting information for money. Was this known? It wasn't known by anyone apart from the people who were involved. It only became known to Badrish Gohill later on. So after he has served his time. After he is in the, well, he's in the middle of serving his time. And so he ran an appeal which centred around this alleged corruption. And the, at the appeal, he just had information. He didn't have the hard evidence. So in the appeal, the court had to rely on the prosecution to ask them whether or not the corruption existed, whether there was any evidence. And the prosecutor told the Court of Appeal there was no evidence, that there was nothing to disclose on this, on this appeal. So basically the prosecution was saying it's all nonsense. And then they charged him, Badresh Gohill, with perverting the course of justice, i.e. lying about the corruption. Mm. And they used this as a tactic to prevent the appeal succeeding. So there you have the Court of Appeal judges listening to the defence submission saying there is corruption here and listening to the prosecution saying there is no corruption here. And they then charge him just before the appeal with lying about it. So the Court of Appeal are going to say, which they did, that the corruption didn't exist because there's no evidence. So that's how he came to be tried after losing his appeal. And th that was on, on the part of the prosecution giving false information. False information. Misleading the court. Misleading the court, absolutely. We now know, because I was representing him in the forthcoming trial, that there were hundreds of documents, hundreds of documents, which have now been d disclosed to us, many of which point to the fact that there was corruption. So payments, meetings, telephone calls, tip-offs, um, cash payments into a bank account, all of this indicated corruption on the part of the police. And nobody knew about this. Police and police. Yes. And nobody knew about this because the prosecution said there was nothing to disclose at the appeal. But when you get to the trial, you then go through a disclosure process and lawyers ought to and nowadays do ask for disclosure of the material which indicated corruption. So myself and my junior and my solicitor wrote application after application to the prosecution for information about corruption and slowly it began to come out. So then we had a body of evidence which showed the corruption did in fact exist and that the prosecution had misled the Court of Appeal mm. about its existence. And this process went on for 18 months. And eventually there was so much material which showed that the corruption existed and they'd covered it up that the prosecution dropped the case. So suddenly, so they dropped the case on the day of trial, 
they dropped the case. And they didn't tell us why they dropped the case. So they're still not telling us what's really going on. They're telling us absolutely nothing about why they dropped the case. But the only reason can be either that the corruption existed or that they covered it up, or both. Okay, now let's, let's, let's establish a bit of some information here. This police officer that was involved in that investigation, mm -hmm. who incidentally served as a double agent collecting money from risk manager who was supposed to be working for James Ibrahim at the same time, collecting money from the police. Who was funding that investigation? So um, the, there's a unit called the Proceeds of Crime Unit who were the investigating officers okay. of James Abori and then of Badrash Gohill because he was added to the charges for doing the same thing allegedly and the officers were being paid for um, I'm not sure whether their entire salary is paid or most of their salary is paid by um, uh, the Part Department of International Development in the UK, DFID. Yeah. So, so DFID were funding the police investigation. So it was clearly in their interest that it wasn't a corrupt investigation. And when the corruption started to come out, it was covered up. Okay. Now let me put this straight to my viewers. DFID was funding that investigation yes. involving money laundering in James Bory. By both James Abori and, and allegedly Badris Gohill. Okay. Uh, do you by any means know if uh, David has any form of relationship with Nuhu the Badu or uh, the EFCC? I mean, we know they have a relationship with the EFCC because they have, they, they have to deal with each other in terms of their business and okay. their, the EFC is an investigation organization. They have to rely on EFCC officers to get information for them um, when they're carrying out investigations. So yes, the answer is there is a relationship. We don't know the depth of it. We don't know whether it's a proper relationship or a partly improper relationship. We just don't know. But these are questions we're currently asking. But in the course of that case, you were able to establish that EFCC and DV has or had some form of relationship? They, they have always had, because they're investigators, the EFCC. In, in the course of your interaction with um, Goyal, did you by any means know if David has any form of relationship with James Ibori? Um, Diffid own various companies, one of which is the Commonwealth Development Corporation, CDC, CCDC, and they had a business relationship with James Abori in several companies. <laughs> so let's establish this very well. CDC is a business arm of Diffid. Yeah. So Diffid. CDC has commercial and financial relationship with James Ibori. Had, yeah. Had yeah. with James Ibori. Yeah, so I understand. So there is a kind of business relationship between, let's put it literally, Diffid and James Ibori. Yes. Now, Diffid that has had business relation with James Ibori, now funding the money laundry prosecution the, of James Ibori. Um, the investigation, the investigation by the police into money laundering. Yeah. Oh, by the way, who holds Diffid? Who owns Diffid? Yeah. Oh, well, Diffid is a government, British government department. Oh, so Diffid is a British government yeah. department. Yeah. So by the head of Diffid is the British cabinet. So minister. by implication, we say British government had through CDC yeah. a financial, commercial, business relationship with James Ibori. Yes. 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 And then they investigate him for money laundering. And then they are now investigating him. Well, they for did. Money. They did investigate him, and they res they got a conviction. And so, British government through defeat CDC that had commercial financial business relationship mm -hmm. with James Ibori, mm -hmm. convicted James Ibori. They investigated him as a result of which he was convicted. As a result of which he was yeah, convicted. Yeah. So we had business partners fighting. And then, you know, I, one used some <laughs> kind of relationship yeah. to send one. To I, don't, I don't know. Nobody here on this side of the fence knows.